Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a brand new author by the name of Hobo Sam 21, and I believe another exclusive for the channel. Of course, as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why, it really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Hell's Ranch. Let's get straight into that. My name's Scott Wellington. I used to be a pretty average guy. I owned a small one-man window installation company. I wasn't rich, but I made a good living at it. All that changed about a year ago. You see, I decided that I was going to buy a lottery ticket. And amazingly, it was a winner. I know, crazy, right? I buy one ticket, and I win. I know people who have spent their entire lives spending thousands of dollars, and they've won nothing. And so you would assume that I'm a pretty lucky fellow. And I guess I am. So... What do you do when you win a little over $200 million? Well, I was always pretty good with money. I was never rich, but I know how to budget. And I know how to get by with what I have. And so now that I had more money than I could ever spend in a single lifetime, unless of course I was an idiot like many lottery winners, and blew it all on the first six months, I decided to move away and retire. I'm 35 years old now and have a huge savings account. I don't have any family in the area or anything like that, and I don't really have any close friends. The crazy thing is, I spent so much time working that I never developed any deep relationships with anybody. And so, when I got all of this money, I decided, well, why stay in this dead-end little town? I have nothing against little towns. I actually really enjoy small-town living. But this little town is more of a meth-head congregation than anything. Oh, there's probably more drugs per square foot in this area than there is any major city. And so, I started shopping around. You see, I wanted something with privacy. I don't have anything against neighbours either, but the best neighbour you can have is the one you can't hear or see. And having read up on all the different lottery winners who spent all their money on mansions and then couldn't afford the upkeep and ended up with more debt after winning the lottery than they had before, I knew I wanted to buy something affordable and easily maintainable. I had invested a lot of my money and was watching it grow, but I knew it wouldn't cover everything if I start spending like crazy. It's insane how fast some people can blow for a few hundred million bucks. And so, after a few weeks of looking around, I found a rather cheap ranch out in Utah. It was a beautiful place, about 522 acres. It even had a creek with a waterfall. On the property was a somewhat small four-bedroom log cabin, but that's more than I needed as a single man. I pretty much fell in love with it right away. The cabin had all exposed beams and wonderful woodwork, making it just a truly beautiful place. It was a little dated, a little worn down, but I'd worked construction for enough years I was fairly confident that I could clean it up and get it all working order on the cheap. And so I talked to my realtor. He filled some paperwork, and before I knew it, I had the keys to my very own ranch. I had been abandoned for close to 15 years, which explained the cheap price. The next thing on my list was a mode of transportation. I mean, who doesn't love a brand new truck? But I've never been one to buy the newest vehicle that comes out. I prefer something a couple of years old. Something where all the little kinks have been worked out by a previous person. And so I found myself a nice one-ton pickup. It only had about 50,000 miles on it, which felt perfect to me. I loaded up everything I owned into a trailer behind it, and I set out for Utah. Well, the drive there was pretty uneventful. A lot of pretty scenery. Of course, I checked out the landmarks. You can't go to Utah and not check out the Monument Valley or Zion National Park. I arrived at my ranch late at night. I believe it was between 1 and 2 a.m. The gravel crunched under my tires as I rolled up the long, unlit driveway. And since the property was empty, there were no lights anywhere to be seen. Nothing to illuminate my path other than some stars overhead. 
and a nearly full moon trying to peek out from behind the clouds. Once my headlights illuminated a cabin in front of me, I slowed to a stop. I opened my door and hopped out of the truck. But then I just stood there for a few minutes and soaked in the silence of the night. Well, there was no light pollution out this far, and so even with a few clouds, the stars were amazing to behold. Retrieving a flashlight from the driver's side door of my truck, I walked around to the cabin until I found the power box. I opened it, I flipped on the main breaker. A light mounted to a pole next to the driveway dimly came to life, and now that I could see somewhat, I went back around to the front. I walked up to the large wraparound porch. Fishing for my keys, I withdrew them from my pocket and unlocked the front door. It opened with a loud creak. The interior of the cabin was dusty and smelled a bit like mould, but that's about what I expected for sitting empty for so long. I entered in the dining room, I flicked on the light switch, and all the rooms were completely vacant. I don't know why, but I sort of expected there to be some furniture. With sign, I realised I was going to have to unpack a bed if I didn't want to sleep in the truck. I glanced back outside at a U-Haul trailer that I had rented with all my things in it. I didn't know how deep my bed was, but I knew it wasn't anywhere near the top. And going back outside, I dug around the trailer for a bit, but it was useless. It was too dark and I was tired and didn't feel like taking everything out. I knew there was a blanket in the back of the truck, so I figured I'd just lay down on the bench seat and sleep until daylight. And I lay there for what felt like hours, sleeplessly tossing about. Eventually, I did drift off. I woke to birds chirping and the sun high in the sky. Glancing at my nearly dead cell phone, I saw that it was 10.42am. Uh, I guess it's time to get up, I said to myself. In the daylight, the cabin looked a little more run down than it had at first. The windows all had plywood nailed over them. Nearby trees had dropped a lot of debris on the roof. That quaint western wraparound porch that I was admiring last night now looked like a lot of work. There were many missing railing boards and even a few boards missing from the decking itself. I sleepily walked around the building, taking a closer look at it. My teeth felt dirty, and my back hurt from sleeping in the truck. <sighs> well... Guess I better start unpacking, I said to myself. Making my way back to the trailer, I began to pull everything out, one piece at a time. I stacked all the boxes in the living room, and a man handled what little furniture I owned into the bedroom. I had previously rented an apartment in which most of the furniture came with it. All I had to my name was a double white bed, a microwave, a lazy boy recliner, and some random dishes. As I began to unpack all my clothes, I realized I didn't even have a dresser to put them in. I stacked what I could on one of the shelves in the closet of the master bedroom, but once I had everything unpacked, it became apparently clear that I needed to go do some shopping. I figured that I'd have to go into town to drop off the U-Haul anyways. Even if I did have a couple of million bucks, I didn't need to be charged for an extra day if I didn't need it. And locking up the cabin behind me, I made my way back to the truck and headed for town. Less than 20 minutes from my house, there was a medium-sized town. It had a population of around 5,000 people. I had a McDonald's, along with some small stores. I should have about everything I need. Rolling into town, I first headed to the hardware store. I knew I needed some lumber to repair things around the house. This was one of those small town stores where they had a little bit of everything. From fishing supplies to AC filters to a lumber yard in the back. Making my way inside, I looked around for an employee to ask where I can get the lumber at. I made my way to the front counter, which apparently was vacant. And ringing the little help, wanted bell, I stood there waiting. It wasn't more than a minute before somebody walked up and asked how they could help me. It was a blonde-haired girl who appeared to be in her late twenties. She had noticeably blue eyes and an attractive figure. Hi there, how can I help she asked. I bought a cabin a little ways out of town and need some repairs. How do we go about picking up treated lumber from here? Well, that's easy enough, she said. Just drive around back, load your truck up, and then when you come back this way, stop out front and I'll ring you up. All the prices are on the rack. I thanked her and then headed back out the door. I wasn't used to the type of place where you just load your goods up before you pay for them. 
but I guess that was a good sign for the type of area I was in. After loading up with the treated 2x4s that I needed and paying for them, I headed to the U-Haul store and dropped off by trailer. And after that, I made my way to the one and only major box store in town. You guessed it, Walmart. Anyways, after buying a dresser and some other appliances that I knew I would need, I got everything loaded up and strapped down and began to make my way back towards my property. It wasn't a long drive, but definitely had to go a bit slower this time with my precariously loaded truck full of wood and appliances. Well, maybe I should have just kept the trailer after all, I thought to myself. Anyways, I arrived back at my cabin and spent the next two hours sweating profusely, trying to unload everything by myself. After dropping stuff more than a few times, I finally got everything loaded up into the house and placed where I wanted it. And luckily, it all still worked. Who knew you could drop a stove down the stairs twice and it would still be in working condition? And one of the perks of owning your own business is you acquire a lot of tools over the years. And throwing on my utility belt, I began to pull down all the plywood that was covering the windows. And then I moved on to repairing the rotten boards on the deck. And before I knew it, the sun was beginning to drop low in the sky. And I figured it must be time for dinner. It was at this moment that I realised something. I hadn't bought any food. I literally did not have a single piece of food in the entire house. Sometimes I wonder how I made it into adulthood all by myself. And so, once again, I locked up the cabin, hopped into my truck, and headed into town. At first I thought I'd just grab a McDonald's and go grocery shopping, but I really wasn't feeling the fast food at the moment, and so, instead I swung by a small southern style diner. It had a welcoming environment to it. I seated myself in a back booth and one that had a good view of the whole room and the entrance. It was something I'd gotten into the habit of a long time ago. As I was reading over the menu, I heard a familiar voice speak up. Well, what will you be having tonight, stranger? I looked up to see the same girl that was at the hardware store, now dressed up in a waitress's outfit. Oh, hey there. Do you work here as well? I asked. Nah, she replied. I just dress here like this for fun. With that, I had to chuckle a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a pretty stupid question. Uh, anyways, uh, I think I'll have the cheeseburger and the strawberry milkshake. I said with a smile. I heard name tag read Laura. I was going to have to remember that. She had definitely caught my eye, dressed in jeans and a red vest at the hardware store. But with her hair pulled back and a ponytail, black leggings and a pale yellow polo shirt, she was truly stunning. As she walked off, I leaned back and took a look around the restaurant. There was a shelf running along the wall, just below the ceiling, filled with old hunting tools and farming implements. And other than me there, there was only two other people in a whole restaurant. One sitting at the bar drinking coffee, and eating what looked to be scrambled eggs, and the other reading a newspaper at a booth on the far side. The man at the booth briefly made eye contact with me, and gave a slight nod of the head before returning to his paper. I decided to pull out my phone and fiddle around while I waited for the food. It wasn't long before Laura returned with my burger and shake. Uh, you mentioned you bought a cabin somewhere around here? Does that mean you're from out of state? Laura asked me as she handed me my food. Uh, yeah, I'm actually from the Oregon coast. <laughs> Is it that obvious? I asked, and she smiled and replied. Uh, just a little. I motioned for her to take a seat across from me. She sat down and then asked, What brings you to Little Old Elk City? It's not like we're a high tourist attraction. And I shrugged my shoulders. I don't know. I just needed a change and had the opportunity to do so. And so I outrooted and moved out here. And she raised her eyebrows at me. Really? So you don't know anybody out here? And I shook my head. No, uh, I actually never been to the state before. Well, the property was a good deal, and I liked the looks of it, so I ended up buying the place. She raised her eyebrows at that, and then putting out her notepad, she scribbled down something on it. I think you'll find that we're a pretty friendly bunch around here. If you ever need something, don't hesitate to give me a call. And she slid me a piece of paper with a phone number and a name on it, and then got up and served the man 
at the bar and have a cup of coffee. After that, a large group of teenagers came in and ordered a bunch of milkshakes and fries, so she was busy for the rest of the night. I finished my meal and then paid my bill and made my way out. Laura waved at me as I left and I returned the gesture. After some quick grocery shopping, I decided to head back to my place for the night. At that point, it was already late in the evening and the sun had been down for hours. I was driving on the dirt road up to my house, eyelids heavy from the lack of sleep. And the headlights were illuminating the desert plants and the dusty road. When suddenly, a hundred yards ahead of me, something flashed across the road. My foot smashed the brake pedal to the floor as I slid to a stop. Suddenly wide awake, I peered out into the darkness. I wasn't sure, but I could have sworn it was a white humanoid shape. Almost as if somebody had stripped naked and covered themselves in flour before running across the road. It happened too fast and was too far away from me to be sure, but oh, it was definitely something weird. And rolling down the window, I looked out into the darkness, a little closer to see if I could spot something. Shutting off the truck so I could listen closer, I sat there in silence. There wasn't a single sound, not even a common cricket's chirping in the night. I feeling a little unnerved, I rolled the window back up and started the truck. I glanced in my mirror real quick before pulling ahead, but all I saw was blackness. I headed back to my house without incident, and even though I hadn't seen anything since a couple of miles back, I didn't waste any time going from my truck to the house. I closed and locked the door behind myself and then turned on the lights. Everything was as I had left it, deciding it was just sleep deprivation. I made my way to the bedroom and decided to call it a night. Throughout the night, I woke up multiple times from bad dreams that I couldn't remember. Each time, I would shoot up covered in sweat, look around my room before remembering where I was. Then try as I might, I couldn't remember what the dreams were about. This continued all the way until the sun rose. At that point, I decided to cut my losses and just get up for the day. Making my way to the kitchen, I remember that I never unpacked the groceries that I bought the night before. They had spent all night out in the truck. Luckily, it's pretty chilly at night, so I doubt anything spoiled. After retrieving the food I had bought, I made myself a small breakfast, and then began to walk around the property some more. Well, there was definitely a lot of work to be done. Stretching out as far as the eye could see was a well-worn barbed wire fence. The wooden posts had long since rotted off, and were leaning left and right, held up only by the tautness of the wire itself. Remembering the events of the night before, I decided I'd go for a walk down the road and see if there were any tracks. At this point, I pretty much convinced myself that what I saw was a figment of my imagination, but confirming that with a quick walk, I wouldn't hurt anything. I get dressed in a pair of work boots, blue jeans and a grey t-shirt, I made my way out the door. I was halfway off the porch when I decided it would probably be a good idea to bring a handgun with me. Although, I wasn't expecting some crazy naked albino man to attack me. There was a lot of other things out here, such as cougars, bears, snakes and possibly even wolves, if the rumours are to be believed. It took me close to an hour of slowly walking to reach the spot where I thought I'd saw something last night. Glancing around, I guess there really wasn't anything out of place. No signs of tracks. No broken brush, not really anything, to show that something had come leaping across the road. I guess it really was just my imagination. And turning back, I made my long walk back to the house. I was less than halfway back when I heard some rustling in the bushes next to me. And pausing, I turned and looked to where the sound was coming from. Less than a hundred yards to my left, it sounded as if something had snapped a dry twig. The area was mostly clear of brush. There was a small tree, but with two bushes at the base of it, and a little bit of prairie grass. Deciding that I really didn't believe in weird things, I began to approach the tree, pistol in hand, of course. It was a six-shot revolver, chambered in a forty-four Magnum, and so unless it was really an angry bear, I should be able to handle whatever is hiding back there. Raising the handgun slightly, I made my way closer to the tree. I circled around the backside and keeping a wide berth as I went, and soon the back side of the tree was in view. 
Looking down the sights of the pistol, I studied the whole area. It was completely empty. Lowering the gun, I walked closer. I inspected the base of the tree. There did appear to be some slight scuff marks in the sand, as if something had been there. Looking up, I saw a pair of beady little eyes staring down at me. I jumped backwards in surprise. Less than three foot above my head sat a raccoon. He looked at me as I looked at him. At this point, I began to laugh at myself. All this trouble over a little baby raccoon. And shaking my head, I holstered the pistol and began walking back to the house. After that, I began to work on the deck and it took me a few hours to get all the old boards tore off, but due to the rot, most came off fairly easily. Once I had repaired, I began to walk around the property a little more. And something had occurred to me. Where might be the location of the well? Well, At this point, I spotted a small shed near the rock wall that bordered the backyard. It was about eight feet by eight feet, but with a low ceiling. Assuming that this was the well house, I made my way towards it. It was a wood structure with a tin roof, made from rough-cut lumber. The wooden door creaked on large metal hinges as it swung open. Peering inside, I saw what looked like the well head, along with a pressure tank. Well, at least everything in there seemed to be working properly. After that, I made my way back to the house. Instead of focusing on the outside, I began doing a deep clean on the inside. Sweeping the whole house out, followed by mopping, and then finally dusting off every single surface. Well, it took me the rest of the day. As the sun once again began to draw down, I couldn't help but think about what I'd thought I'd seen the night before. It's just something about living out here in the middle of nowhere, completely alone, that gave me the heebie-jeebies. It's not like I wasn't used to living alone, or even that I was a city kid, but well, this was a different kind of alone. On cloudy nights like this, there wasn't much. On cloudy nights like this, there wasn't a light to be seen. It felt as if I were the last man on earth. I was shaking the thought from my head, I stepped out onto the porch and gazed across the inky blackness that was my land. It's then that I spotted something peculiar. Far off in the horizon, there was a flickering light. Not like a plane or a light from someone's house, but almost like a fire. I think there was no way a fire could be that high in the sky. I tried to remember what was out that way. I was pretty sure there was a mesa twenty or so miles out in that direction. The altitude would match, but it would have been one hell of a fire for me to see it from here. Or maybe it was just a lack of other lights that made it visible. I'm no expert. Also, the colour was off. It had too much red and even some purple at times. I shivered as a sudden chill ran down my spine. Stepping out onto the porch, I peered into the dark night. In the distance, it came a rhythmic thudding. I quieted my breathing and tried to focus on the sound. Drums. Someone was beating on multiple drums in unison, creating a tribal rhythm. I caught myself walking closer. I had reached the edge of the porch before snapping back to reality. Shaking my head, I felt that icy chill once again. The beat. The fire. There was something unnatural about it. It felt taboo. I instinctually made my way back across the porch towards my front door. A flash of movement at the edge of my property caught my attention. I turned, but was too slow to get a clear view. And I could hear something crashing through the darkness. Whatever it was, it was heading for the flaming mesa and was making good progress. I stepped inside, closed and locked the door. Laying in bed, I remained motionless. A sleep escaped me. Adrenaline coursed through my body, keeping my heart rate elevated. On this property... I was starting to feel unwelcoming. I must have drifted off because the next thing I knew, I was waking up to the sun coming through my window. The large windows in each room seemed a lot less attractive after last night. They suddenly felt like a security risk. The thought of replacing the plywood that had covered them crossed my mind, but I dismissed the idea. I would move out before living in darkness. Getting up, I made some breakfast. I decided I'd head towards the mesa I saw last night. With the sun rising, I felt a lot more courageous. Filling a backpack with snacks and water, 
I threw it into the bed of my pickup. I drive as close as I could and then hike the remainder of the journey. I took a couple of hours of picking my way across various desert roads before I reached a point where my stock truck couldn't continue without fear of getting stuck or destroying the vehicle. Retrieving my pack, I locked the truck and began making my way on foot. And after an hour of walking, I realized two things. The Mesa was deceptively far away, and I was not in as good a shape as I thought I was. Sitting on a nearby rock, I drank the last of my water. I doubted I was within a mile of the Mesa yet, and I decided it was time to turn around. I would try again at a later time. Standing up, I became aware of a buzzing noise. I was approaching rapidly. The sandy, sage-covered hills surrounding me blocked my line of sight, but as the noise grew closer, it morphed from a loud buzz into a familiar, rap, rap. I quickly stepped off the trail, just as a blue dirt bike sailed past me. I nearly returned to the trail when a second bike, this time an orange one, sped past Shara and me in sand. I was spitting and rubbing up my eyes, I cussed under my breath. Bro, I am so sorry, said a voice from nearby. I didn't see you there at all. I turned to face the bike and it gave me the desert shower. The rider of the blue bike was the one talking. He pulled off his helmet to reveal a shocking amount of golden blonde hair. He looked to be in his late teens, of average height, fit but not built. This was obvious due to him not having a shirt on. The other rider removed his helmet as well. He looked younger but not by much. The sibling resemblance was obvious as they sat on their bikes side by side. I had no harm done. I said as I shook some of the remaining sand from my hair. Is that you, chalk pile by the trailhead? The older sibling asked. I nodded. I came out this way for a little hike. They looked at each other and went back to me. Strange place for an out of town to be hiking, said the younger one with an inquisitive tone. I pointed back the way I had come from and replied. I got some land back that way, sir. I'm technically a local. Well, the elder spoke up again. Strange place for a local to be hiking to, but well, if you're the kind of guy that buys a place like Hell's Ranch, then maybe it's a normal decision. Hell's Ranch? I questioned. This time, the younger one answered. That's what we call this whole area. Do you two always talk in turns? I asked him. Fair observation, said the elder. But no, said the younger. People say it's because we're birthday twins, but personally, I think it's just because we spend too much time together. We talked for a little while longer, and learned they lived on a property adjacent to mine and had been homeschooled. The older brother's name was Matthew, and the younger Mark, and they were 18 and 16, respectively. When I asked why they call this area Hell's Ranch, they quietened down considerably, which is something I had a feeling didn't happen very often. Well, it's been called that for as long as white folk have been in the area, explained Matthew. A lot of weird shit happens out here. Unexplainable things, usually after sundown. Well, I like weird fires and drums on top of mesas, I asked and gestured towards the rock tower I had attempted to reach. And Matthew nodded. Yeah, I mean, we know what that is, but stuff like that usually coincides with sightings and sounds that are harder to explain. Mark started looking uncomfortable, and I noticed he didn't say anything when Matthew finished talking. And Matthew seemed to feel uneasy as well, kind of like he'd said more than he should have. Anyways, said Matthew, it's getting late and you don't want to be out here after dark. Why don't you hop on and I'll give you a ride back to your truck. Despite feeling a little awkward about riding behind a shirtless high school kid, I took him up on the offer. It was a long walk back, after all. The ride back took less than 30 minutes, which was enough to convince me that I needed a dirt bike in my life. Taking my truck home, I showered and got cleaned up for the trip into town. Throwing on a fresh pair of jeans and a t-shirt, I made my way into town. And driving down the main road, aptly named Main Street, I spotted Matthew and Mark talking to a group of similarly aged girls. Matthew was still shirtless, and judging by the lack of tan lines, I assumed that that was a regular thing for him. Matthew gave me a slight nod as I passed, which I returned before continuing down the road. And I pulled into the parking lot of the diner Laurel worked at, and made my way inside. 
As luck would have it, she was working tonight. I waved at her and made my way over to the booth I had sat in previously. Laura made her way over to me. I see you're a man of habit, she commented. The usual? she asked. I might as well. I replied well, leading back. Laura wrote down my order and asked, So, how are things going at your new house? Well, I found out your locals call this area. I live in Hell's Ranch. I said with a smile. Laura froze slightly. Where was it you bought a house? She asked quietly. When I told her my address, kind of taken aback by her reaction. The whole restaurant seemed to quiet down. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination or not, but the room felt colder. Laura tucked a stray hair behind her ear and then cleared her throat and asked, The previous owner wasn't Bob Kidden, was it? And thinking back to all the papers I had signed, I replied, Yeah, I think so. Kidden, at least. I can't say for certain his first name was Bob. But when Laura didn't say anything, oppressed, why does that matter? Laura abruptly turned and walked into the kitchen. Not even a full minute later, the double door separating the kitchen from the dining area burst open, revealing a large hairy man in a chef's hat and apron. He strode into the centre of the room, and then bellowed out. Where's the sorry son of a bitch that upset Laura? His eyes landed on me, and in them I saw violence and pain. He took a step in my direction, but before I could react, a man in a police uniform stood up from the bar where he had been enjoying a chicken sandwich. Hey now, Jack. Calm down before. You end up spending the night with me again. Neither one of us wants that. Breaking eye contact with me, Jack the chef asked. Did you see what happened, Bruce? The officer whose name was apparently Bruce replied. I did, and it was an accident. Laura asked how things were going, and the kid here told her he bought the old kid in place. That was all. He didn't mean no harm. Jack grunted, and then turned to walk back into the kitchen, slamming the door behind him. I released a breath I didn't know I was holding. Thanks. I don't know what the hell just happened, but I felt like I dodged a bullet. And Bruce returned to his sandwich. Ah, Jack's a good guy. He probably would have given you a chance to explain yourself. Any idea what all of that was about? I asked. Bruce seemed to ignore my question. The room was deadly quiet. All eyes on Bruce. And sighing in defeat, he grabbed his wide brim hat and turned to me. Let's take a walk, kid. I hadn't got my food yet, but I wasn't sure I wanted to eat anything Jack was currently offering. And following Bruce out the door, I noticed no one in the room looked particularly curious, almost like they knew what Bruce had to say. A few dozen feet from the cafe, Bruce spoke up. Ah, there's a lot of history in this area, kid. Most of the families have been here for generations. We all know each other pretty well. He paused to roll a cigarette. He offered me one, but I declined. And shrugging, he lit the cigarette and continued walking. Ah, there's a family that owns the land next to yours. The Stumps. Good people. They have three boys, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Well, he suddenly had my attention now. I kept silent as he continued. Almost two years back now, we got a car from her mother, Susan. She was so agitated I could barely understand her. Apparently Luke was missing. They had looked all over the property and at this point they'd been gone for hours. And Bruce took a deep drag of his cigarette, holding it briefly before slowly exhaling. And judging by his body language, I was guessing Luke's story didn't have a happy ending. I headed that way as soon as I hung up. Bruce continued. The sun was nearly down by the time I got to the homestead. I knew that I should have waited for daylight, but I didn't. I called for a search party. I could clearly see the guilt on his face, even though I couldn't think of a reason for it. And Bruce rubbed the now spent cigarette against the sole of his boot and pocketed the butt. Randy was Laura's husband, and he was the first to arrive. Soon we had twenty men ready to search. It was late in the night before anything happened. Randy's voice came across the radio, claiming he'd seen the boy in the redskin butte. Now the rest of us had grown up here, but Randy was from Maine. He met Laura in college, and they moved back to her hometown after getting married. I yelled into the radio for him to stay put, and we all ran in his direction. And Bruce paused again. I could tell this was difficult for him. 
continuing, Bruce said. I was less than 200 yards away when I heard Randy scream in pain. Ah, he was a good kid and didn't deserve to go that way. I could see a body laying in the sand, illuminated by the moonlight. Something had broken both his legs at the knee level. And as I grew closer, I saw the pool of blood creeping out from under him. I rolled the body over and saw his face was contorted into a horrified scream, cut off by a severed throat. We walked in silence for a few minutes before I dared to ask. So, what killed him? Bruce looked at the ground. Ah, the official report is that he was a victim of a bear attack. I looked him in the eye. But you don't believe that's what it was, do you? Bruce shook his head. I've lived here for 54 years. I can't tell you what's out there, but I know you never go out after dark. Especially not around Redskin Butte. What about the kid? I asked. Bruce shook his head. Never found any trace of him. It'll be two years next month and he's still missing. I know his brothers go out looking any chance they get. They were the ones watching him that day. Losing the baby of the family, I nearly destroyed them. He answered. It's a touchy subject in this area. It's best not to bring it up. Especially around Laura. Bruce added. I thanked him and began to make my way back to my truck, mulling over what Bruce had told me. It was a local legend, of course, but likely nothing more than a wild animal story that had grown over the years. Maybe Bruce needed it to be something more to help with the guilt of losing someone under his watch. Regardless of what happened to poor Randy, I decided a little more protection wouldn't hurt. And one thing small-town Utah has plenty of is gun stores. And passing a diner, I made my way over to Dave's wonderful world of weapons. A tacky name, but no doubt anything I might want would be in that store. When I entered the front door, I was greeted with vials and aisles of camo hunting gear and camping necessities. Along the back wall read firearms in large black lettering. I was greeted at the counter by none other than Dave himself. The man looked like Ted Nugent's twin brother. Ah, what can I do for you? He asked. Well, I replied. I bought some land near a certain butte with quite a reputation. I have a handgun. But you'd like something. Well, let them all slap to it. Dave interrupted. Yeah, more slap. I chuckled. How's your budget? He asked. Uh, not an issue, I replied. And he winked. Aragonian pie farmer. Not my style, but more power to you. I chose not to correct him. Well, this pretty thing right here ain't cheap, but she knocked down whatever you might come across out there. Dave held up a stainless steel lever action rifle with a blue and grey stock. Chambered in a forty five seventy, I'd have killed anything in the state within a thousand yards. Heck, I'll zero in the scope for you, Dave offered. Well, I'd never owned a rifle before, so I took his word for it. With my new self-defense weapon and a hundred rounds of ammunition in tow, I returned to my truck and decided to call it a night. Driving home, it wasn't long until my headlights illuminated a run-down cabin. Progress was slower than I'd like. I was struggling to find motivation, working alone and without any clear goals. Money was making me lazy. Well, there was no accountability out here. I was throwing a rifle on the couch and made my way into the bedroom. It wasn't long before sleep sweet embrace took a hold of me. A deep, scratching noise startled me awake, and sitting up, I heard it again, this time accompanied by splintering wood. Jumping out of bed, I stood in silence, listening. The scratching started again. This time, it was much louder and more frantic. It rattled the bedroom wall. It reminded me of the sound a dog makes when it's trying to get into a house, only much, much more aggressive. And my first thought was that it might be a rabid bear, or perhaps even the same one that killed Laura's husband, Randy. And throwing open my bedroom door, I sprinted into the living room, where I scooped up my newly purchased rifle. Chambering around, I pointed the gun at the wall, where the scratching continued. Fuck off! I yelled out, more to bolster my courage than anything. The scratching stopped instantly. The house stood in silence. 
I stayed frozen in place for what felt like hours. But finally, my arms grew too tight to hold the rifle any longer. Putting on a pair of boots and grabbing a flashlight, I made my way to the front door. A questionable decision, for sure, but I would rather face the problem and deal with it than have it sneak up on me later. Unlocking the deadbolt, I eased open the door. For once, it didn't creak loudly. Throwing the door the rest of the way open, I pointed a flashlight and the rifle first, left and then right. The night was dead silent, not so much as a breeze to rustle the nearby brush. And carefully, I made my way around the cabin's perimeter. I was more annoyed than anything at this point. And I advanced one boot in front of the other, lightly crunching the dry sand underfoot. And shining the flashlight around the yard and surrounding desert a final time, I shrugged and returned to the indoors. Making my way to the outdated single-pane bedroom window, I saw that it was locked, and going around the house, I secured each one. Satisfied, I locked the front door and went back to bed, this time with the rifle propped against my nightstand. I woke the next morning to birds singing, and sunlight blinded me. Rubbing the sleep from my dried-out eyes, I groaned and stretched before swinging my legs off the side of the bed and sitting up. I ran my fingers through my hair, and standing up, I decided whatever was harassing me out there was going to regret coming onto the property. A feeling of purpose rose up inside of me. I missed having goals. Before sundown, I would have the property set up in such a way that no wild animal would be tempted to come within 100 yards of it. After a quick breakfast of bacon and eggs, I jumped into my pickup and made for town. The now familiar dirt road turned to asphalt as I neared the town. Without hesitation, I pulled into the parking lot of Dave's wonderful world of weapons. And pushing open the double glass doors, I walked straight to the front desk. Dave looked genuinely glad to see me, and he shook my hand. Now when I didn't hear any gunshots last night, I figured you might not be coming back. Why would I not be coming back? I asked him. Dave glanced around the nearly empty store. Uh, why don't you step into my office? Without waiting for a reply, Dave turned and walked through a small, unmarked door located behind the desk. And despite feeling apprehensive, I followed him. But Dave's office was larger than expected. Against one wall was a plush leather couch, and opposite the couch was Dave's oversized wooden desk. Behind the desk was a wall of weapons, many of which I doubted the average citizen could legally own. And Dave sighed, interlaced his fingers, and then began. I'm sure you're aware that your property has a rather negative reputation locally. I nodded, and he continued. I'm not a superstitious man, and I don't believe in ghosts or Indians past, nor do I believe there is a devil-worshipping cult hidden underground. That being said, I have lived here my entire life like my father before me and his father before him. But Dave leaned back in his chair. To put it plainly, a lot of people have disappeared or died, either on your land or near Redskin Butte. The property gets bored and then the owners abandon it, or I'll sell it to the next sucker. But Dave Porso, I asked a question. Don't the police investigate the disappearances? Surely this can't be going on for generations without the feds getting involved. Of course, the police try. Uh, there are local boys and girls who Arthur know the victims personally. Uh, we had the feds out here, and we've had professional monster hunters come out, and even a world-famous exorcist. No one finds a thing. The only clue we have is Randy's body. The feds snatched that up right away. But now before the town doc got a chance to check out the wounds. Uh, his neck was snapped as if someone had broken it from behind. But there were claw marks like that of a big cat. Finally, his legs had been broken by something with crocodile-like jaw strength. I sat quietly, absorbing what I had just been told. I couldn't help but think about what I'd heard last night. Do you have any guesses as to what I'm dealing with out there? I asked. Dave shook his head before answering. My guess is there's a small pack of mountain lions out there, even though there has never been any spotted for almost a hundred years. Uh, one more thing. Dave said as we both stood up. Don't go asking around. A lot of people have had loved ones die out there. There's more than a few who believe the place should stay empty. In fact, 
I bet you if any animals go missing, you'll be the first to be blamed. Well, Dave, I replied, you better break out the big boy toys because I'm not going anywhere. Something was testing out the cabin last night. If it comes back, I want to end things quickly. Dave grinned ear to ear. Oh boy, I've been waiting my whole life to hear that. Let's get you some questionably legal firepower. I spent the rest of the morning spending tens of thousands of dollars on rifles, ammos, traps, night vision, flashbang grenades that weren't legally grenades, cameras and even some body armor. As I loaded the last of the guns into my truck, Dave called out. Get a class free license and I have some more options for you. And chuckling at his enthusiasm, I waved goodbye and backed out of the parking lot. I returned home a few hours before sunset. I spent that time setting up game cameras all around the property, followed by bear traps. I loaded the two thirty round magazines for my newly purchased AR fifteen. Next I set out grenades in each window sill. At first I had assumed the round iron bars crisscrossing the windows had been a decorative touch, but as I examined the mounting points, I saw they were likely for protection. Much like the large four by eight inch beam that could be used to lock the door. The more I looked, the more I saw that a cabin was built to withstand any sort of assault minus fire. And the horizon turned to a blood red as the sun slid behind the mountains and the mesas. I wiped a rogue bead of sweat off my forehead and gazed across the land. Maybe I was being foolish, but something about being forced on my land rubbed me the wrong way. Before the last rays of light disappeared, I made my way into the cabin. Checking each window and both doors, I settled in for a long night. And the last couple of sleepless nights began to sneak up on me. I found myself nodding off a couple of times. My head would jerk up with a start every time. And glancing at the clock on the stove, I saw it was nearly 3 a.m. Yawning, slowly I walked into the bedroom, head down. Exhausted, I kicked off my boots and laid down. It felt as if my eyes had barely closed when I was rudely awoken by knocking on the front door. Stumbling through the cabin, I heaved the massive beam block on the entryway out of its slot and opened the door. Sheriff Bruce stood on the porch. He removed his reflective aviator sunglasses and placed them in his breast pocket. You look like hell, he commented. Good morning to you too. It's been a rough couple of nights, I replied. Bruce glanced at a bear trap in my yard and then looked past me at the new forty five seventy leaning against my fridge. I expecting trouble? he asked. I had a feeling this wasn't a social call, but Bruce's expressionless face didn't give anything away. Uh, I started, but he caught me off by raising a hand. Ah, you've been to Dave's. It's a small town and people talk. If you're having trouble, I'd like to know about it. After all, I am the law around here. Well, it's just some, just some animal snooping around. Nothing I can't handle. I told him. This seemed to satisfy Bruce. Well, anyways, there's a town meeting tonight. I think you want to be there. Curiosity peaked, I asked. What's it about? And Bruce removed the sunglasses from his pocket and put them back on. Just some wild animal killing livestock in the area. And with that, he returned to his police truck. I watched as the white F-150 sped down the gravel road towards town. That evening, I found myself driving into town. The town meeting was being held at a library. A large log structure situated along Main Street, one of the only buildings in town with a large enough room to hold big groups. I walked into the building and was instantly assaulted by multiple yelling voices. Bruce was standing behind a white folding table along with two other men. The room was filled with chairs, but nearly everyone was standing. One particular man who looked to be in his 40s was red in the face and yelling at Bruce. And judging by his jeans, hat and button-up flannel shirt, I assumed he was a farmer or rancher. The steel double doors behind me clanged loudly as they slammed shut. The noise caused the entire assembly to turn and look right at me. And I gave an awkward nod and I tried to make my way to an empty seat. Before I made it ten feet, I was intercepted by an angry rancher. He jabbed me in the chest with a bony finger. You're the asshole who's stirring up trouble, a redskin butte, ain't you? 
he demanded. Swiping his finger away, I replied, I'm not stirring up anything. I'm minding my own business and fixing up the old cabin. And the man's face got even more red. That's the problem. He nearly screamed at me. Tom, that's enough. Yelled Bruce from across the room. Slamming his palm on the plastic table, Bruce silenced the room. He spoke up. Everybody, take a seat. We're going to hold a civilized meeting. Anyone who doesn't like that idea is welcome to leave. The crowd murmured and shifted about. Sit! Bruce bellowed. As one, the whole room, myself included, dropped into our seats. Now, Bruce began. I'm going to let you speak your piece, Tom, but be aware that you are on a short leash. The rancher stood and said, Sorry for the commotion, Bruce. You know how personal this is to me. Bruce nodded, and Tom continued. Last night I found two of my steers dead across the Freedom Creek. Coyotes had gotten to them pretty bad, so I assumed the cat had killed them. And the atmosphere in the room grew chilly, as if everyone except me knew what was coming next. This morning, I woke up to find three more steers dead along with one of my dogs. There were just bones left of the steers, and that and a pile of three heads, stacked neatly at the base of a cottonwood tree. At about fifty feet up the tree was the mutilated body of my dog, Diesel. I was shocked. Was he insane? If not, then what could do something like that? And Tom looked straight at me before saying, Everyone here knows there's only one thing that beheads prey like that. No one spoke. No one so much as moved. And Tom pointed an accusing finger at me. He woke up the Wendigo. At this, the room exploded with shouts and people pushing one another. Someone punched Tom in the jaw, sending him to the ground. Don't say its name! Bruce sprang into the crowd, shouting for everyone to calm down. I backed up against the nearest wall. This town is crazy, I thought to myself. A loud metallic clashing sound brought some order to the room. Matthew stood at the far end, smashing two metal chairs together. Once the room quieted, he threw both chairs to the ground. What the hell, people? He yelled at the adults in the room. Pull yourselves together, you bunch of superstitious assholes. Something is out there, killing animals again. At this, people began to look ashamed. Many of them set him back down while others looked down in embarrassment. Last time they started up, everyone fought amongst themselves until people started going missing. Matthew continued. We can't do that again. A burly red-headed man stood and spoke. So long as that cursed ranch stands empty, whatever it is out there lays dormant. Matthew shook his head. You know that's not true. We lose three times as many lambs and calves as the neighboring counties. And how long has everyone turned a blind eye to all the missing campers and hikers? He asked. When no one replied, he continued. We ignore all the missing tourists because it means our families and friends stay safe. Even then, sometimes those we know and Love disappear as well. Matthew choked up a little with the last sentence. I remember what Bruce had told me. Matthew had lost his younger brother in the desert. What if I were to kill it? I heard myself asking. I don't know why I had said it. Logically, it made sense that if there was a predator out there killing, it was the best solution. The red-headed man now focused his attention on me. I's been tried, he said. No one has ever found it. Well, I wasn't a hunter, but I felt as if I should at least try. I also didn't believe that this was some supernatural beast, but most likely just a non-indigenous animal that had the locals stumped. Well, how about this? I reasoned. I'll go out tomorrow night and walk around the Redskin Butte area. I'll either come across and kill the problem or join the missing. And the group murmured in approval. I wasn't sure which outcome they were rooting for, but... It felt as if it was a win-win situation for the town. Honestly, I don't even know why I was willing to do any of this, but I was committed to it now. An elderly lady spoke above the crowd. If you would happen to not return, should, should we expect family to come looking or inherit the property? Well, it was a good question, and I shook my head. I don't have any family to speak of. And in fact, if I disappear and get pronounced dead, the city can have my land. That way, you can do what you think is best with it. Was I being foolish? Probably. But if I were dead, 
It would have mattered to me what they chose to do. Bruce tapped a plastic gavel on the table and announced the meeting was adjourned. The people began to filter out, many of them looking at me like I was a lunatic. A man stopped to speak with me before exiting. If you're serious about going through with this, you should talk to the Ute elders. They might have some insight as to what you're up against. I thanked him and walked out of the building myself. After checking my traps and cameras, I went to bed. The next day, I did as suggested and drove out to the nearest Indian village. I wandered around for a while, not sure of who I should talk to. A hey, white boy, yelled someone to my left. I turned to see a wrinkly old man dressed in traditional Native American clothing. Yes, you. Why are you walking around like a moon day's calf? He demanded to know. Well, I was told that the elders living here might have some useful information. The old man huffed. <laughs> I don't know what Ford would have suggested that, but best you run along. A bit taken aback by his rude attitude, I didn't know how to reply. The man made a shoo-in gesture towards me. I'm going to hunt the creature of Redskin Butte tomorrow night. I blurted out. The man perked up a little. Oh, is that so? Why, I never talked to a dead man before. With this, he exploded into a wheezing fit of laughter. Crazy old jackass, I said under my breath and made my way back towards my truck. Hey, white boy, the old geezer yelled once again. On your hunt, keep watch for the spirit bird of our people. I looked back wondering what he meant when I saw him flip me off. This time, he almost fell off his chair, laughing. Shaking my head, I climbed into my truck and left the village behind. What a waste of time, I thought to myself. I spent half the day driving out here just to meet a crazy old man with a chip on his shoulder. It was mid-afternoon before I got back to the cabin. The first thing I noticed was a blue dirt bike leaning against the porch railing. As I approached the cabin, I saw Matthew standing in the shade at the outside wall, intently watching something on his phone. He looked up as I climbed the steps. What are you doing here? I asked. Waiting for you to get back? He replied. No shit, I said. But why? Nonchalantly shrugged. Monster hunting, I guess. I shook my head. No way, dude. I'm not taking a kid out there. What would your parents say about you being here? Matthew walked up to face me. I'm 18. We can go together, or I'll go alone. Either way, I'm going. His shoulders were squared and his face set. He had a look of such determination. I couldn't argue with him. I could call Bruce and have him lock you up for trespassing, I pointed out. First off, Bruce wouldn't lock me up. Secondly, you own this area, but you don't own around the butte. Matthew smirked. Like I said, we can go together or separate. And I have a feeling, once the sun goes down, you want someone to watch your back. Oh, you made a good point. It was a smart kid, determined to get his way. Fine, you can tag along, but I insist on you letting your parents know where you are. Matthew nodded. Deal. We should leave soon. I feel like gaining the high ground before dark will be in our best interest. This made sense, so we began packing up everything we think we would need and threw it into the bed of the truck. Matthew knew of a dirt road that would take us within a couple of hundred yards of the base of Redskin Butte, and from there we would have to hike in. The legend had it that no man had camped under the butte and returned in the morning. And this had enough evidence to back it up that the park actually banned overnight stays within a mile of the butte. Granted, the park had claimed it was to protect the wildlife, not to keep people from getting eaten. It didn't take us long to arrive at the base of the stone tower known as Redskin Butte, where its sheer rock walls rose above us, reaching into the sky. The setting sun's last rays lit up the rocks with a blood-red colour, casting ominous shadows across the desert sand below. Matthew led the way, rifle in hand and backpack laden with ammo and flashbang grenades. Matthew had opted for my 4570 lever action over his AR-15, and now was carrying my newly purchased Sega 12 shotgun. The 30 round magazine was loaded with buckshot and one ounce slugs intermittently. In my pocket was five Dragon Breath shells for just in case. Just in case of what I didn't know. 
but Dave was an excellent salesman and had convinced me that I would need them. Matthew and I climbed to the top of a precarious pile of round stones that ended against the smooth rock wall of the butte. Well, I guess here is as good a place as any, he said as we surveyed the desert below. I agreed. Nothing could get us from behind without first climbing down a 200-foot cliff. A frontal assault would require climbing up the rock pile we had just crossed, which would be both difficult and noisy. I moved a couple of rocks around to make a more comfortable sitting area. Matthew looked lost in thought as he gazed out over the rapidly darkening sand and brush. Once again, I questioned why I was doing this. Cryptid or not, I was still spending the night somewhere a lot of people had died. Regardless of my rational disbelief in Wendigos, there had to be an apex predator of some sort. And soon the sun completely disappeared behind the hills, encompassing us completely in darkness. Hours crept by slowly as I fought sleep. I had nearly nodded off when movements in the brush below caught my eye. I peered intently at the sagebrush about 50 yards in front of me. Bringing a shotgun to my shoulder, I clicked the safety to the off position. And hearing a soft click, Matthew looked in my direction questioningly. Without breaking eye contact with the bush, I pointed down the hill. My ears picked up a soft, slithering sound. The sound stopped, heart pounding, I tried to make out anything in the inky blackness. It was the sound of feet slapping on rocks to my left, and I spun while standing and flipped on the flashlight that was mounted to my shotgun. I nearly dropped a gun when I saw a man-like shape less than six feet from me. The creature was crouched on a rock above me, or it hissed at the bright light. Its skin was a light grey colour, nearly white. Its eyes a polished black that reflected the light. The creature raised its arms to shield its eyes, and I saw instead of fingernails, it had two-inch claws that also looked like polished black glass. Recovering from the shock, I was about to pull the trigger, when Matthew reached over and gently pushed a barrel on my gun down. What the hell, dude? I yelled at him. Ignoring me, Matthew pulled a piece of beef jerky from his pocket and threw it to the rocks below. Without hesitation, the spindly man-like creature skidded down the rock pile after it. It pounced and then held the jerky up above its head while doing what I assumed was a victory dance. And two similar creatures burst from the brush and raced towards the first. It squeaked in alarm and dropped to all fours and then raced across the desert faster than I thought would have been possible. The other two creatures in hot pursuit behind it. I looked at Matthew and he shrugged. Ghouls. I don't think anyone really knows what they are, but they're harmless for the most part. The most part? I questioned. Well, they're similar to coyotes. Scavengers mostly, but still a wild animal. That's not an animal, I said. That's nightmare fuel. And Matthew laughed at this. Well, I guess I'm just used to them. Sometimes they're gathered around with fires on top of the mesas and beat rocks on hollow logs they drag up there. You don't want to shoot them. They're really hard to kill, and if you hurt one, the rest will attack. Matthew explained. Why call them ghouls? I asked. Ah, they used to get caught digging up bodies from fresh graves. You can guess what people's reactions were to seeing one of those running out of the graveyard at night. We sat each deep in our own thoughts, the Milky Way above us putting on quite the show. A hare cautiously crept from bush to bush as the owl flew overhead on silent wings. A nearly full moon illuminated the desert below. And now that my eyes had grown accustomed to the dark, I was able to see for miles. Despite the chill in the air, I struggled to stay awake. Eyelids heavy, I thought how I was only two hours until sunrise. My head snapped up, and I realized I had fallen asleep. And looking to Matthew, I could see he was out as well. The farthest horizon had the slightest pink tinge to it. Sunrise was not far away. The snap of a twig brought my attention to the landscape below. Rambling slowly along was a mangy-looking grizzly bear. My heart began to thud so loudly in my chest, I felt as if it would be heard by the bear for sure. Picking up a small pebble, I intended to throw it at Matthew. Looking in his direction, I saw his eyes were open as he sat motionless. I could see rage burning in his expression. 
After two years, he was finally laying eyes on the beast that had taken his younger brother. And suddenly, he raised a rifle to his shoulder. We made eye contact, and I nodded in approval. The bear continued on its oblivious path. It was less than 70 yards away at this point. Matthew gently breathed out and slowly squeezed the trigger. The rifle boomed, and Matthew, losing his balance, fell back onto its back. The big game round exited the barrel and flew true, striking the bear just behind the front leg with a meaty thwack. The bear bellowed in pain and dropped to the ground. I jumped to my feet and yelled out in celebration. Matthew regained his footing, grinning wildly. He ejected the spent casing. Matthew's smile dropped, and he cried out. Oh shit, he's not dead. I turned to see the big bear back on its feet and headed in our direction. Its eyes burned with an unnatural red glow, and it roared in rage at us. Matthew's rifle boomed again, the bullet carving an ugly wound across the top of the bear's skull. It roared again, but didn't slow its charge. Without a thought, I began to fire my own gun. Pulling the trigger as fast as I could, I rained down buckshot and slugs. Now the bear stumbled to its knees. A well-placed shot from Matthew caught it in the throat, and the bear collapsed. It lay on the ground twenty-five feet away, wheezing, blood pulling out from it, creating red streams down the rock pile. Removing a now empty magazine from my shotgun, I added my fire dragon breath shells to it. The great beast began to stir. Slowly, it placed one paw, and then another under itself. Rather than charge, it stood on its hind legs, towering over fourteen feet tall, and it looked down at us with those same hate-filled red eyes. It pointed at me with an almost human-like hand. I heard a single word in my head. Trespasser. Before our eyes, the bear grew thinner, almost emaciated. This was way too much. I aimed the shotgun at the creature's face and fired. The flaming shards of magnesium embedded into its face and eyes. It released an unearthly howl and clawed at its face. And I turned to Matthew and yelled, Run! He didn't need any convincing. We raced down the pile of stones, hoping to reach the truck before whatever that thing was back there had a chance to recover. The pained howls changed into enraged roars behind us. I put everything I had into running. Despite this, Matthew was steadily pulling ahead. He reached the truck first and leaped straight into the driver's seat and stunned at the engine. I barely had time to leap into the bed before he peeled out and pointed towards town. The truck bounced dangerously down the dirt road. Round on a corner, I felt a massive impact on the driver's side. The truck lifted onto two wheels, and time seemed to slow. The truck continued tipping and I jumped from the bed before it went over. Hitting the ground, I lost hold of my shotgun. The impact caused my vision to blur. I lost consciousness for a short time. And snapping awake, I heard fighting coming from the truck, which now lay on its roof. I painfully half-limped, half-jogged to the truck, retrieving my shotgun from the ground on my way. Each step sent a pain exploding through my knee, but the thought of Matthew wrestling a demon bear was enough to spur me on. What I saw was no bear. An unnaturally tall, bone-thin native man had Matthew by the hair and was dragging him out of the truck. The man's body was covered in scars from a century of battles. Matthew's hair ripped from his scalp and the sudden lack of resistance caused the man to stumble backwards. Taking advantage of the distance between him and Matthew, I dumped the Romanian force shells into him. The blast was blinding and the man screamed in agony. Tossing the now empty shotgun aside, I rushed to the truck, and inside Matthew was bleeding from his crushed nose, as well as his new bald spot. Fucking hell, that hurt. He painfully muttered without opening his eyes. The cab of the truck was badly crushed, and I didn't even bother trying to open the door. Matthew would have to come out the window. It was then that an iron grip wrapped itself around my ankle. I gasped in pain as I felt the joint dislocate. The native demon man violently dragged me backwards and threw me ten feet through the air. I landed in a surprisingly soft pile of sand, and before I could recover, he was standing over me, looking down with those glowing red eyes. He was nearly seven feet tall, but painfully thin, even more so than he had been the last time I had seen him. 
there were still smouldering bits of metal embedded in his skin. He took a step towards me with an evil smile growing. I had hurt him, and now it was his turn. Hey, asshole, catch! We both turned to see Matthew leaning against the truck. He tossed a small round object to the man, who deftly caught it, first staring at the object, and then at Matthew in confusion. The man gave him an almost humorous, What the hell is this? Look. At that moment, I recognized what Matthew had thrown. It was one of the flashbang grenades. Rolling onto my stomach, I covered the back of my head with both arms. The grenade went off, nearly rupturing my eardrums. The man lay stunned on his back, right arm missing, and half his skull caved in. Incredibly, he was still alive. Matthew reacted faster than me. Pulling a foot-long bowie knife from his belt, it charged at the man like creature. Then dropping to his knees, Matthew raised the knife over his head, and plunged it into the heart of the man. He let go in shock when the blade began to sizzle and release an oily black smoke. We both took a step back as the man convulsed and screamed in pain and terror. His body started shriveling up, his skin drawing so tight across his bones that it tore, split. He clawed at the air in my direction, hissing curses in his native tongue. His skull imploded with a wet squelch and he collapsed to the ground. What was a bear, and then a man, was now a contorted, two-foot-tall black doll. Its flesh looked like that of a mummy, and its eyes resembled small black beads. Matthew's knife remained in its chest, but it was no longer sizzling or smoking. What exactly is that knife made out of? I asked, not expecting an answer. Matthew reached for the knife, as if to pull it out, and then changed his mind. I don't know its origin. My grandfather gave it to me. The only thing he said about it was that it was blessed by an old shaman in return for something he did to help the tribe. The sun had fully risen. The corpse at our feet seemed to be dead for good this time. So, what now? asked Matthew. And shrugging my shoulders, I replied, I don't know, but I'm not touching nothing. The truck is totaled and we have no cell service and it was already starting to get hot. Well, it's only going to get hotter as the day goes, I suggested. And with Matthew following close behind, I began walking down the sandy gravel road towards town. One foot in front of the other, we trudged along the path. And thankfully, less than an hour passed before we saw the dust cloud of an approaching vehicle. Bruce's police truck pulled up to us, put in the truck in parky, climbed down and walked up to us. You two look like shit. He stated, and I didn't doubt it. Well, you're alive, but did you kill anything last night? Matthew and I shared a look before I replied. Yeah, we did. I'm not sure what, but we definitely got something. And Bruce pointed to his truck. Ah, let's get you back to the station, and you can make a statement there. Hey, one more thing, Bruce said. Your mother is going to skin you alive when you get back to town, Maddie." Matthew winced at the thought. She's been harassing me all night about you, Bruce added. We rode the rest of the way into town in silence. Once the police station was visible, I saw there was a small crowd gathered in the street near the main door. Bruce took us around back, and after entering the building, we were escorted to a small room. Well, there was no obvious one-way mirror, nor was there shackle rings in the floor, but I was pretty sure we were being held in an interrogation room of sorts. Bruce returned with a recorder and a notepad. Let's go over last night. Don't leave anything out, he said. Well, it must have taken hours, but we told him every detail. When we were done, he looked at his notes and then back at us. Well, I can't submit this to the FBI. They think we're all crazy. Or worse, they will leave it. He rubbed both of his temples. Leaning back, he looked at us both in the eye. Here's what we're going to do. Report it as a grizzly bear. There's been one here many decades ago. And who's to say it can't happen again? With that, he led us to the front door and the waiting crowd. A woman a bit older than myself rushed up and had crushed Matthew in a hug. You dumb boy! She yelled while still embracing him. You could have died out there! Matthew hugged her back tightly. 
Ah, I know, Ma, but I had to, for Luke. And Mark stood near his mother. So, what did you see out there? He asked quietly. The noise of the crowd ceased instantly. Everyone seemed to lean in closer, waiting on an answer. Matthew glanced at me before replying. Ah, just a rogue grizzly bear. Was all, he said. Lies! shouted a voice from the back, and people parted to make way for an ancient Indian elder that I had spoken to a few days earlier. He pointed a bent and wrinkly finger at me. The foolish white man has slain the Yilan Lushi. Now the Managishi will return to Rome freely. Ah, shut the hell up, Charles, came a shout from the crowd. The elder glared daggers at the man and then turned and stormed off. We stood there for most of the morning, answering questions and accepting congratulations. And I felt like the people of Elk City were starting to welcome me. But that was all three weeks ago. Life is much more relaxed these days. I got the cabin repaired, along with a few outbuildings. I hired Matthew and Mark to help with a lot of it. Laura came by one evening to check the place out. I guess removing a demon from Hale's Ranch helped her get some closure with Randy's death. The local pack of ghouls still creeped me out, but everyone says you get used to them. The native elder, whose name I learned was Charles, turned out to be a lifelong troublemaker. It was him that convinced half the town that they were under siege by a wendigo. And I was informed that his rants were best to be ignored. All in all, I am growing to love this area. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely enthralling, action-packed and spine-tingling story there. Exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel, and from a brand new friend and author, a Mr. Hobo Sam 21 A big thank you, Sam, for getting in touch and allowing me to narrate this incredible story on the show. Absolutely riveting storyline and great character development. And wait with bated breath for the next update. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack of things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I, and I hope you're having a fantastic week at work or school. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you're getting stuck in and giving it your all. But above all, guys, remember be safe, not sorry.